שלום לכולם, ברוכים הבאים למפגש האחרון הסמסטר של הקולוקים בפקולטי. לא אגזול מכם יותר מדי זמן, כל מה שאני אגיד עכשיו זה שמכיוון שזה המפגש האחרון, מה שנותר לי להגיד לכל המשתתפים זה מעבר לתודה על ההשתתפות, שיהיה בהצלחה בכל המשימות של סוף הסמסטר ומה שיבוא אחרי זה, ואנחנו ניפגש בסמסטר הבא, אז בינתיים אני אעביר את השרביט למי שבאמת מעניין פה, שבמקרה זה לא אני, אלא אלי קלר, אלי, השרביט שלך, בבקשה. תודה רבה דני, שנייה שם פה איזה בעיה או בעיה במיקרופון, תודה לכולם, תודה גם לדפי ולאהרון על ההזמנה. אני אעביר את ההרצאה באנגלית ברשותכם ואני אשתף את המסך שלי רק אם תוכלו להגיד לי ש... עובד? אוקיי. אוקיי, so hi everyone again, thank you Duffy and Dani and Aaron for the invitation and I'm very excited to share some of my research with everyone. Um, I'm a... PhD candidate in the history, theory, and criticism of architecture and art uh, in the Department of Architecture at MIT. Just finished my fifth year of the PhD and hopefully uh, towards completion in the coming year. And the work I'm going to show you today is a, a version of an article that I will be submitting in about a week's time for the Journal of Architecture. So any comments that you might have might uh, turn to be extremely useful. Um, I think I'll be talking for about 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions. Um, but I want, before I get to the lecture, I want to say something a little bit about my general research, um, which deals with questions of representation, architectural representation, drawings, um, and uh, nuclear fears. So this paper that I'll be presenting is not part of my dissertation, but it's very much at the core of the issues that I'm dealing with. And I wanted to start with this video in the background, um, which is a documentation of the nuclear experiments carried out by the United States in 1946 in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific Ocean. And it's an image that I saw, or a video that I saw um, in the Whitney Museum, which was taken by an American video artist and recalibrated and projected on a huge wall. And I remember the kind of affect that it produced and the kind of fear mixed with beauty and terror. Um, and that kind of pushed me towards uh, engaging with the question of nuclear weapons and imagery and so on. Um, so what I hope to do today is take you on a little bit of a journey through images and literature and film and questions of policy and politics and technology. And at the end arrive at an example which uh, of the kind of imagination of architecture that let's say emerges or comes out of this constellation and uh, see what we can learn from it, hopefully. So with that, I'll start. So our story begins around 1945. Since the end of World War II, American cities have been repeatedly destroyed. This destruction, however, was neither physical uh, was not physical, but rather imaginary and projective, the sort of continuous imagination of a future apocalypse that would take place in American cities after an inevitable attack by the Soviet Union. Within the numerous or even countless uh, uh, catastrophic images of the future, architecture and cities almost always played an important role. In many of these imaginations, we often find injured architectural icons, collapsed infrastructure, and visions of America's greatest cities from New York to Washington DC to Los Angeles obliterated beyond repair. So this rehearsal of a nuclear apocalypse, this war that will be unlike anything that anyone has ever witnessed created an American national consciousness that was founded on the production of imaginary ruins. And additionally, it also supported an imagination of, and creation of architectural spaces and infrastructure, which were buried underground. So beneath the visible fictions, the images and imagination of destructions, Cold War culture left a kind of excavation, an underground space that was evacuated and punctured with countless missile silos, hidden command centers, scattered bunkers and buried fallout shelters, the legacy of which extends into our present. 
And by that, I mean both the fact that some of these underground infrastructures are left abandoned, many are still operating, but also, and maybe even more important, is that to this day, there are thousands of nuclear weapons and hundreds of tons of nuclear waste that are buried underground around the world and present a great challenge both to policymakers, environmental scientists, and to a degree to architects and planners as well. So the history of the underground, whether we're talking about physical interventions or imaginary ones, is complex and varied. We can think about Haiti's underground kingdom of the dead, Dante's trip to a kind of mind-looking inferno, or Jules Verne exploration to the planet's core. Throughout history, and these are only a few examples, the space beneath the earth has fostered countless fictions, myths and visions within Western cultures that were often asso associated either with discovery or with sin. In more recent history, it was the emergence of modern science and technology and the physical changes to the environment uh, that were caused by industrialization and urbanization that created a renewed interest in the underground. The historian of science, Rosalind Williams, who writes about such underground narratives, claims that many of them were about truth finding and were associated with metaphors of the human psyche, like Freud, for instance. Others, like stories about social revolution, would often describe the underground as ugly or slimy or dark, and with that contribute to its ambiguous representation as both utopian and dystopic space. So as I mentioned, Williams focuses on late 19th century literary underground narratives, and she sees those as historical evidence that provides a, quote, prophetic view into our own environmental future. One of her main points is that 19th century uh, narratives brought up the idea of the underground as an artificial rather than natural space. In her work, she cites the philosopher and technology and occasionally architectural critic, Lewis Mumford, as the first person to define the underground as an environmental metaphor. In his 1934 book, Techniques and Civilization, Mumford writes about minds and calls them um, a model of an artificial environment from which nature has been effectively banished. Or he also calls them the first completely inorganic environment to be created and lived, by, uh, lived in by men. So for Mumford, minds were kind of extractive enterprise that was crucial for the development of modern capitalism and reshaped both physical and political worlds. So while this was happening outside of urban centers, a complex reality was, develop was developing in cities between the world above the ground and the one below it. In the late 19th and 20, early 20th century, urban centers were growing rapidly and their growth was supported by expanding environmental destruction and continuous extraction of materials, a network of sewage lines, subway systems, and other infrastructures that, would, uh, that were all created underground. The cities were expanding horizontally, they were also developing vertically with a virtually invisible network that would deliver everything from electricity to water to information and evacuate waste and sewage. The urban underground would become a kind of invisible space or partially invisible that supported modern life. So as I mentioned, Williams' uh, work focuses on late 19th and early 20th century narratives, but she also writes very briefly about the post-war period, so 1945 and onwards. She associates those narratives with the appearance of atomic weapons and suggests that the post-war decades have fulfilled the 19th century prophecies of environmental displacement and provided human imaginations with future scenarios of ecological or climate catastrophe. So if the 19th century fostered an underground imaginary of total artificiality, the Cold War, and specifically the Cold War armed race, used the underground in the process of transforming the imagination of the apocalypse into a, quote, techno-scientific project and a geopolitical paradigm. On the one hand, underground spaces were imagined and created to serve as the physical infrastructure for the military and political doctrine of deterrence. So the idea that both the US and the USSR would accumulate atomic weapons in such a way that would make their use basically impossible. As is the case in the uh, 1964 film, Dr. Strangelove, the underground was imagined both as the place where decisions about the world's end were taken and the space in which the bombs that created the world's end are stored. At the same time, through programs such as civil defense, through intense propaganda and with the growing industry of fallout shelters, 
The underground was not only the place from which the apocalypse would literally be launched, but also the place where you could imagine, the only place where you can imagine to survive it, whether in a bunker or a shelter in your all-American backyard. So what is interesting to me about the underground is a place of survival on one hand, of secrecy on the other, and finally as the place where nuclear bombs are stored, is how it all fits into larger cultural understandings of the Cold War. Figuratively, and perhaps more than any other conflict in modern history, the Cold War was very much about deceit and concealment. In this battle, which big part of it was conducted through propaganda and cultural artifacts, visual and literary images played a key role and helped foster fears of the unknown. And we all are familiar with the famous uh, saying by Winston Churchill, who said already in 1946 that an iron curtain is drawn upon their front. We do not know what is going on behind. So there's a kind of connection between what uh, we could see behind the Iron Curtain and what we thought we knew was behind it. So this impenetrable screen, which was both metaphorical and physical, this Iron Curtain was dependent on a kind of imagination of the underground that was both opaque and suggestive, a kind of layer that hides something and at the same time provides hints that something terrible or sinister is hiding underneath it. During the Cold War, that thing that was hidden was not only policy or hidden infrastructure, but also an unknowable and virtually infinite stock of nuclear weapons ready to be launched. The weapons were accumulated infinitely in the project of threat maintenance, and they were considered to be too effective to be used. So atomic weapons in a kind of strange paradox were developed and perfected precisely for the purpose of never using them. So as I mentioned before, this was uh, part of a kind of paradoxical Cold War status quo. For the strategy of deterrence to be effective, each side had to present itself as absolutely willing to use its invisible stockpile of nuclear warheads, making the possibility of retaliation extremely unlikely, if not strictly impossible. At the same time, each side was in the opposite position. That is, it was being threatened by another side who was also willing to use their weapons. So what this means is that both sides had to be both willing and completely unwilling to use the infinite arsenal they were hiding. And so the power of atomic bombs was amplified not only by the rise in their physical capacity from 10 to 20 kilotons that were used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki to 50, 60 megatons used by the Soviet Union in 69. So let's say about three and a half thousand times more powerful. So the power of atomic bombs was amplified also by their invisibility. The larger a nation's stockpile would be in the enemy's covered eyes, the less likely their adversary would be willing to attack. So if we accept this view, we can't consider the atomic bomb only as a weapon, however disastrous it may be. Instead, we need to consider not the bomb, however singular or destructive it may be, but rather all bombs that were ever produced but never detonated. We need to think of their stock, their accumulation, their storage. In other words, we need to think about, about them almost economically, to think about their supply and demand. So instead of thinking of the use value of nuclear weapons, that is how much it costs to produce a bomb and what kind of destruction it creates, we think about projected value, something that must, must never be liquidated, and their present value that is maintained through accumulation and not through use. So the nuclear bomb becomes a kind of product that you forever accumulate, but that yields maximum return when it is not used. So this idea, however strange it may be to look at nuclear bombs as products, sound a little problematic, but it is not without uh, precedent. In fact, it comes in this case from the American nuclear age novelist, Don DeLillo, who in a novel world, um, in his last chapter, um, he speaks about a protagonist that travels to a Soviet-era test site in Kazakhstan to see an experiment orchestrated by a company that uses nuclear weapons to destroy nuclear waste. And as one literary, literary scholar noted when he was writing about Delilio's uh, work, he claimed that Delilio presented uh, the atom as the, quote, perfect product of capitalism within a cycle of supply and demand. Nuclear waste is also nuclear fuel. The destruction of nuclear waste produces a further demand for nuclear fuel. 
So Delilio's text and the way it was interpreted reminded me when I was going through these materials, some of the writings of the German philosopher Martin Heidegger. Specifically, it was this view of nuclear bombs as a product and their accumulation, their use to produce more nuclear waste, which reminded me of Heidegger's concept of standing reserve in his 1953 essay, The Question Concerning Technology. The essay, which was written at the dawn of the atomic age, was concerned not with a specific kind of need, but more with the way we think about technology or more precisely say, thinking that is behind the creation and use of technology. Now, I won't go too deep into Heidegger's thinking um, since we don't have time um, nor the will, I think, but I want to try and focus on one of his points in, in the essay that is relevant to what I've been talking about. So one of the main claims that Heidegger makes is that modern means of production or industrial technology fundamentally changes the way of being in the world for humans, their unique place in the universe. So instead of what he calls bringing forth or revealing something about nature, which is what traditional technology does, modern technology challenges forth. It asks nature to do something that it is not used to doing. What this means is that with modern technology, humanity is no longer a part of a kind of natural process of production, but rather controls it. Uh, it presents to nature what Heidegger calls an unreasonable demand and asking it to supply energy that can be extracted and stored. So with modern technology, our understanding of nature has changed from something that is miraculous or mysterious that we're part of to something that is under our command, a raw material that we can use and accumulate. And one of the main examples that Heidegger uses this is the building of the hydroelectric dam on the Rhine River which transforms the Rhine from a river with all the mythical and symbolic and ecological meanings that we can think of to basically a battery that humans control in order to produce energy. Agriculture is another example that he uses and says that it transforms into, quote, mechanized food industry. And it presents everything as what Heidegger calls a standing reserve. So that is a resource that can be extracted, manipulated, and stored. And the danger and the reason that Heidegger points to all of this is that if we continue with this process, humanity itself will eventually turn into such a resource. And if we think about our own contemporary times and the way our data is being extracted and stored in service and used and so on, we can say that maybe Heidegger was not completely off the mark. But in any case, uh, Heidegger gives a particular example that is related to the nuclear age, uranium which is necessary for the production of nuclear bombs. And he writes, air is now set upon to yield nitrogen, the earth to yield ore, ore to yield uranium. Uranium is set upon to yield atomic energy, which it can be released either for the destruction or for peaceful use. When it is released, this energy becomes the standing reserve. It is transformed, it's stored, and it creates a system of accumulation in which what is stored up is in turn distributed, and what is distributed is switched about ever anew. So both Heidegger and Don DeLillo, the author which I mentioned earlier, stand respectively at the beginning and at the end of the Cold War. And their observations taken together kind of present a full circle. So if Heidegger expresses the kind of technophobia mixed with nostalgia that was very characteristic of the first post-war years, DeLillo's ideas of the atom bomb as product represents a kind of retrospective cynicism that was con common after the end of the Cold War and the absence of nuclear fears. What both texts share, however, is that the fear of technological, the technological threat and its banality are expressed through a critical reassessment of the function of technology. And in this regard, both texts point to one of the, let's say, craziest episodes within Cold War history. And please excuse my non-academic jargon, but hopefully you'll agree that the word crazy is probably the best uh, word to describe this. So the fictional nuclear experiment in Don DeLillo's novel appears to be at the very least inspired by a very specific history of an American scientific project called Project Plowshare and the idea of using nuclear explosives for peaceful purposes. So Taking place primarily in the US and the Soviet Union, peaceful nuclear explosions were conducted from the late 1950s and up to the end of the Cold War. 
The American program, which was comparatively short than the Soviet one, was called Project Plowshare. In Plowshare in Hebrew, would say etot or machreshot. Uh, the project was as concerned with its public reception as it was with scientific plausibility or financial efficacy. And it was named after the idea or the plea of the prophet Isaiah to turn swords into plowshares and weapons into instruments of cultivation. It was part of President Eisenhower's Adams for Peace initiative. And at least partially, it was supposed to be a response that would counter those images of destruction that I began with. The program was conducted in collaboration with the Atomic Energy Commission and was led by the controversial Hungarian-American theoretical physicist and father of the hydrogen bomb, Edward Teller, we can see here on the left of the slide. And it suggested the constructive use of nuclear weapons for purposes of earth moving, infrastructural projects and resource extraction. In a way, it echoed some of the texts of Lewis Mumford about war and mining, who compared warfare uh, as he called it, the other crucial agent of modern industrialization with mining due to their mutual dependence on destruction and brutal force. The people behind Plauscher did precisely that, and they used the bomb's kind of positive and progressive force to, to, for, their, for their purposes. So it is important to remember um, that Plauscher was not some fantasy or dream, but a serious scientific program that was advanced by scientists, politicians, and policymakers, and in which hundreds of millions of dollars were invested. It's also important to mention that the tests weren't only designed to demonstrate the potential of peaceful nuclear explosions within some abstract realm of science, but were conceived in relation to actual projects initiated by the American government, both within and outside the United States. It was actually the 1956 Suez Canal crisis, which resulted in fairly outrageous proposal to construct a new canal between the Mediterranean and Red Sea through the Negev desert here in Israel, and supposedly place the initial focus of the Plowshare program on large scale earth excavations projects. Other noted projects included the creation of a lagoon for a new harbor in the north slopes of Alaska, or carving out mountains in the Mojave Desert in the Western United States, for the purpose of building an interstate highway or railway. So the ambitious goals of the program led to 31 nuclear tests that took place between 1957 and 1975, mostly in Nevada. Many of these tests were accompanied by public documents, uh, which if you read them, you can really kind of see the megalomania behind the project. For instance, the Atomic Energy Commission released a promotional video which spoke about quote, excavations of new harbors, big dams, canals, passes through the rugged mountainous terrain created in seconds with the tremendous energy of the peaceful atom. And I think Edward Teller said in one of his uh, speeches, if you have a mountain in the wrong place, give us a call. The people behind the program also wanted to reassure the public and claim that every nuclear explosion is first thoroughly explored and proven in exhaustive theoretical analysis tested in laboratory mock-up and often tested again with conventional chemical explosives. Additionally, they also published reports that documented the test and tried to make the magnitude of the experiments more legible and perhaps more palatable, so to speak. So the reports included mathematical equations, tables, carefully drawn diagrams, all of which were supposed to represent the capacity of humans to control the most powerful weapons ever created. So one of the most famous experiments took place in 1962 in the Nevada desert and was called Project Sedan. The purpose of Sedan was first to, quote, extend knowledge of cratering effects and phenomenology to the 100 kiloton range, and two, to provide data on the general nature of the safety problems to be encountered by nuclear cratering detonations. The bomb that was used in Sedan had an explosive yield of 100 kilotons, so approximately five or 10 times stronger than the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively. The bomb was buried 200 meters in the desert underground and created this kind of symmetrical bowl shaped crater with a volume of six and a half million cubic yards and a diameter of 400 meters and so on. And you can understand a kind of staggering amount of material and the, the scale in the photographs. Um, the weight of the earth, for instance, that was displaced is eight and a half million tons. And for comparison, 
The Empire State Building weighs 350,000 tons, so 20 times more. The radiation that was released was five times higher than the scientists predicted and showed that there was a need to re-examine the methods that were used um, to extrapolate the relationship between the radioactivity, depth, yield, and so on. Um, another project that shows that excavation and earth moving were not the only purposes was the first uh, plowshare experiment. It was called Operation Gnome. It took place in December 1961 in New Mexico, where the very first nuclear bomb in history was detonated 16 years earlier. The test asked to study the, quote, possibility of converting heat produced by a nuclear explosion into steam for the production of electric power or the feasibility of recovering radioisotopes for scientific and industrial applications. Here, the bomb was placed 400 meters underground, almost twice as deep as the device in the previous experiment, and was comparatively small, only three kilotons. What was discovered under after the dust settled, you can see in the middle image, was a relatively small and rugged sphere with a volume of 27,000 cubic meters and a radius of 24 meters. So as I mentioned, uh, some of the images we've seen and, sh and, and that we looked at, um, the Plowshare project depended on public funds and perception and was very well advertised. In addition to official and technical reports, Operation Gnome, for instance, was accompanied by a 30 minute long video that showed the preparations, the results, the footage and various illustrations. In addition, you can see on the bottom uh, left, Certificates were given to anyone who participated in the project, and strangely enough, they were drawn to look a little bit like children's books. It was part of this project to make this, again, something not so intimidating. So a little over a decade after the Plowshare project began, it found a very strange expression in popular media and in specific relation to architecture, to its thinking and imagination. In the 1969 December issue of the Esquire magazine, there was a strange image signed by the relatively unknown artist and illustrator, Jean Lagarie. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. Um, the illustration depicted what seemed to be an underground city beneath New York, and it appeared without a title, although at a later exhibition, somebody named it simply an underground city. The inspiration behind the image was revealed in the text that appeared in the magazine. In the text, we also find out that the person behind the creation of the image was not the illustrator, but a Canadian architect, city planner, and theorist, Oscar Neumann, who wrote the article for Esquire in which this image appeared. So this text is bold and, well, I'd say full of hubris. So I think um, to really understand the kind of the gravity of it, I'm going to quote it in full. Somewhere in Uzbekistan, the Russians are using atomic energy to reshape their landscape in a grand way, creating rivers where none existed, bringing forth hills, lakes, and valleys. In Nevada last spring, an underground atomic test produced a perfect hollow sphere, half mile in diameter, 500 feet below the surface of the earth. When some places on earth, such as Manhattan, London, and Tokyo become so highly prized and congested, that building must go somewhere. Professor Neumann suggests moving not only up, but down into a sphere such as the one on the right. He's referencing the image. Manhattan could have half a dozen of such atomic cities strung under the city proper, each with an adequate room for manufacturing and storage in the lower hemisphere, living and working quarters above that and full use of the overhead sphere, perhaps for a cinerama. The real problem in an underground city would be the lack of view and fresh air but consider its easy access to the surface and the fact that even as things are, our air should be filtered and what most of us see from our window is somebody else's wall. And fortunately, the average citizen still has some residue of prejudice against atomic power. And for this reason, it is good to know that the Atomic Energy Commission is now working on a study that will condition us all to the idea of the bomb. So pretty crazy again. Um, but beyond the kind of audacity of this text, I think what's important about both the image and the text is neither their place within a history of unbuilt or visionary projects or its relation to even a longer history of architectural spheres. It's not even the architectural megalomania. Rather, 
It's the connection that the text and image make between the imagination of an underground city and the use of nuclear bombs for constructive or peaceful purposes, thus manifesting the continued connection between weapons, excavation, capital, and destruction in a single image of architecture. So the drawing is worth examining in detail. It shows a section of a spherical cavity buried deep within the geology of the island of Manhattan. And if we look at the architectural objects on the horizon, the Empire State, the Chrysler Building, others, it seems to be located somewhere between downtown Manhattan and the financial district. The Hudson River on the left, the East River on the right, the section shows us the interior of the underground city looking to the north. The buried fabric is organized in a kind of circular plan divided into seven uh, into equal sectors. On the sphere upper surface, we see this Cinerama idea, the Coca-Cola logo, which is supposed to symbolize some idea of American capitalism, consumption projected on a fake sky. In the reinforced concrete dome, we can also see a filtration system going through the layers of the earth and peeping above the ground. These tubes are supposed to create a clean and underground, clean underground atmosphere and circulate polluted air back into the ground above. The two blue pipes that stretch from the interior seem to suggest the collection of geothermal energy, maybe underground ga gas. Around the equator, we see a few arches that look like entrances, and on the left, an elevator carrying people from one world to another. The plan is evenly divided and suggests a very strict, perhaps even geometrical order that reminds us perhaps of some utopian schemes. Underneath the underground city, there is a second underground that in a way mimics the regular orders of cities. When we look closer, we can see some infrastructural spaces filled with machines and pipes, providing the means necessary for the city to operate. A ship is sailing on the East River and passes the Manhattan Bridge, life as usual. So this drawing, as I mentioned, appeared in the popular magazine Esquire, and it was part of the short article that was titled Countdown for Small Towns. In the article, Neumann reflected on what he believed was the catastrophic and inevitable future of American cities. His text begins with a sentimental description of the agricultural, pastoral, and rural past of the US, but it is quickly replaced with, with an apocalyptic prophecy. I quote, by the year 2000, there will be 223 urbanized areas with about 85% of all Americans living or trying to live in them. Happy Americans rocking on their porches, watching their co corn grow will be replaced and engulfed by a megalopolis on a new and terrifying scale. So this text and the, the image were presented at a very particular moment in history. Only a year earlier, in 1968, the Apollo 8 spacecraft provided the famous Earthrise photo on the left and gave an image of the Earth's fragility. At the same time, American cities were perceived as Cold War targets and have grown and sprawled in preparation for an imagined nuclear attack. And in the middle, we can see one of these proposals that were prepared actually at MIT where planners and computer scientists joined hands together to kind of imagine a network city that would be able to survive a nuclear explosion. But when Neumann wrote this text, he was also teaching at Columbia and worked on research for the Department of Justice on the effects of environmental design and social behavior. And he published this uh, study later, which became what he was famous for in a book called Defensible Space. The architectural historian, Joik Knobloch, who wrote about Neumann, uh, both about his work and his history, mentioned this connection between his research about social behavior and the sentiments we can see in the drawing. And I'm quoting her, the theory that humans were inherently violent and warlike was meaningful in an age dominated by fear of nuclear apocalypse and crime in the streets. Still, Neumann's interest in nuclear weapons and technology and the strict absence of fear expressed in his Esquire essay were not explored beyond that particular drawing. The catastrophe that he was interested was not nuclear, but rather a complete opposite, not the physical destruction of cities, but rather their unrestrained growth into an endless and landscape covering urban mass that would make life unbearable. So in Esquire, Neumann would outline the problem and present five architectural proposals from architects such as Peter Eisenman, Jona Friedman, and others that he thought would address questions of hyperurbanization and rapid population growth. His, however, was the only one to make a direct reference to nuclear weapons. 
but it was not the underground's physical capacity to shield society from blasts, firestorms, or radiation, which was at the root of the project's con concept of the underground as a place of survival. Instead, and this is kind of where I think everything comes together, it did so with the threat of urbanization in mind asking the earth to yield space, to enframe it, as Heidegger would say, as yet another resource that can be transformed and stored. And so the nuclear bomb, which Don DeLillo framed in his textual underworld novel as the perfect product of capitalism, finds an analogous role in Neumann's architectural underworld. Architecture is here another modern commodity. It doesn't provide any revelation, poetic or otherwise. Instead, it is complicit and inspired and enabled by the technology of its own time and offers nothing but a positivist resolution to the problems of cities expanding without restraint. Here, it merely stares at the technological and becomes another agent of industry and modernization. Technology, extraction, warfare, architecture, inframes the earth around it into space deposits accumulated and reserved. Analysis again, the bomb, which was once a threat to cities, societies, nations, perhaps a species, turns in the, hands of, in the hands of architecture into a cynical solution to the problem of expansion of civilization. That while the underground city itself is full of hubris and deterministic and questions nothing of the technological, it is the representation of it, if we examine it historically, that offers something else, a kind of character Picture, self reflective parody. The drawing comes as close to the danger of technological determinism without completely giving in. And it is reminiscent of the kind of approximation which serves as a redemptive power in Heidegger's philosophy. I quote him The closer we come to danger, the more brightly do the ways into the saving power begin to shine, and the more questioning we become. For questioning is the piety of thought. And so historically, the image testifies to a past which is incredibly present, in which humans and nations have recklessly played with their own annihilation as they tread the edges of apocalypse. More importantly, and as the environmental and social tolls of human progress are made more visible each day, the drawing reveals the need to reconsider and reconceptualize the very notion of progress and development, to challenge the role of technology as part and parcel of our future and the role that architectural imagination could hold outside of solutionist cycles. Architecture here is not providing a solution to problems that it might not be able to confront, certainly not by itself, like the end of the world, nuclear attack, or even unrestrained urban growth. Instead, and if we look closely, if we question both technology and architecture, the image reveals something that has been known long before any nuclear device was detonated in the American desert that construction and destruction always come hand in hand, or as Hannah Arendt noted, that progress and catastrophe are two sides of the same coin. Architecture and its imagination then are not only tools for providing solutions, but rather a thing, a discipline, a discourse in which history is consolidated and materialized and a lens through which we can understand history and our own place within it in a different and perhaps more critical way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eli. Yes. Um, I know, should I like questions, moderate? Sure. I think I, if that, I stopped sharing. Danny is in charge. Sir, are there questions? You can moderate yourself from my side. Yes, you So, Ellie, uh, following your, your talk, and the connection between uh, nuclear power, 
energy um, uh, technology in general and architecture. Uh, can you elaborate on that and you know talk a little bit more about how you see the connection between uh, architecture and technology? You know, one of your final uh, um, sayings in your talk. Um, I mean, you referred on the nuclear power, this very specific uh, energy and technology, but how would you say you can elaborate on the, you know, maybe more general? Uh, because in our faculty, we, we find ourselves uh, discussing these connections uh, between technology and architecture and the place of technology in the architecture and the architecture development and future architecture and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think for me, I would say my, my stand, uh, generally speaking, is that we need um, to find ways to be more critical about technology. I think we're at a moment in time where um, we're kind of at a, the edge, or at least probably every generation thinks that they're at the edge of something. So our age in a way is at the edge of, of this kind of engagement with technology where we're constantly are hoping that, you know, the next invention, the next big thing will solve all the problems that all the previous technologies have created that we weren't uh, aware at the time. And I think that's a kind of, um, I would say inescapable uh, condition of, of humanity, of invention, of architecture as well. Um, and in that sense, the, the work that I'm doing is looking at a very radical instance, right? Nuclear power is the, the kind of power unleashed by, by nuclear bombs, by, by nuclear fission is really almost ungraspable, but it allows us to examine these things in a, in a radical situation. So as a general statement, I think we need to find ways in which technology is not the purpose, but it is in the service of something else. There's a, you know, I think everybody who speaks about architecture quotes this uh, uh, statement from Cedric Price or something. It's like, if technology was the answer, then what was the question? But I think, yes, we have um, things, problems, you know, climate change, migration, uh, and so on and so forth, that there's certainly need for invention, in a, in a innovation, uh, and so on. But I think part of the, say, issue at hand is that uh, technology is kind of charming and almost magical. Um, and at times we lose sight of, of the other side of the coin. So in general, I'm not, or at least I hope I'm not, uh, presenting a kind of technophobic perspective, uh, because it's not, but I do think that there's place to think critically about technology. And I think this is also where people like me who are in the humanities have a place to work with people in the sciences and in, in departments of engineering and innovation and so on, so that we can kind of move forward hand in hand. Thank you, Eli. Aaron, okay. right here. Okay, so I hope that my microphone works. Uh, so thank you, uh, Eddie, for, uh, for, for your brilliant lecture. Um, <clears throat> one of my, um, I would say, um, favorite, but also obsessive uh, uh, precedent in terms of urban planning is the plan of decentralization of the Chicago region of Hilberzheimer. Now, I understand that that plan was actually based on the possibility of an atomic attack on the United States. And I think that from that plan, we have the American suburbia actually that was born because it was about how to decentralize the economical hubs of the big cities into a, a, a network of small entities that in the case of an atomic blast would actually continue functioning because only some of those units would be uh, destroyed by it. So, my question is like this, is that in, in a way, um, what you've been showing today is that possibility 
that, you know, of the development of an entire world that was, you know, underground. But at the same time, there was also an entire world that was being planned upground, right? And I think that it, it had to do with, you know, this notion of extending as much as possible on the globe the possibility of uh, exploiting the ground, you know, in all kinds of ways. Also, by the way, uh, I think that the air was also part of that plan as well. So um, my question was, is, is very much related to that, is that would you consider that beyond uh, that question about the, this underground uh, exploitation, that there was also, you know, in a way, a relation to all these, those other aspects of, you know, what you would call uh, the, um, uh, the, the national space, you know, uh, being upground or in the air, et cetera. So it's, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm raising that question also because another, another big work that I think could also contribute to your research was, you know, projects like the Do Line, which the Do Line was this uh, extensive line of radars that, that the Americans and the Canadians developed uh, in front of Russia or the, the Soviet Union. Uh, which, by the way, until today is the largest um, man-made work in on, on the globe and, the, and still in a state of being dismantled. And here also, there was this idea of, you know, of controlling, you know, the space in all its dimensions. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, there's plenty of, of other plans other than Gilbertsheimer, and I think it's a little bit... Um, I wouldn't say dangerous, but um, it's a little bit problematic to say that, you know, urbanization or suburbanization in the U.S. was strictly because of nuclear fears. It very much plays a role in it, but so do things as uh, racial tensions. Um, you know, Peter Gallison writes quite a lot about this, what he calls war against the center. So it wasn't only nuclear fears, it was just fears in general of, of bombardment. So American planners studied um, bombing surveys from the Second World War and planned accordingly. So Gallison, for instance, says that it's not about some postmodern ideas of no more center, but it was actually fear that drove this. So there are a lot of factors that play into why suburbs became what they were also, you know, the American dream. Everybody wants a little house and a little uh, fence and a grass and everything. Development of highway. These are all kind of playing into an oscillation, but definitely um, the nuclear plays a big role in this. And, I, and yes, you're absolutely right. This was not only an underground thing. It was on the ground and it was very much in space. At the same time that we have a nuclear arms race, we have a space race. The same missiles that are developed to, you know, go from the U.S. to the USSR in a few minutes are the same missiles that are sending people into into outer space. And then in the '80s, you see um, that the whole battle is going into outer space with the, what Reagan called the Star Wars, or it was called officially Strategic Defense Initiative. So there's very much, you know, the, the entire planet in a way is being weaponized and in that sense I think that's why this period is kind of interesting because this is a moment where there's an emergence of an imaginary of the planet as being threatened so now today we're talking about you know climate catastrophe ecology these kinds of questions these were all rooted already in the 60s both because of ecological reasons but also because of nuclear fears and something happened both in, I would say, the 70s and early 80s, and then after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and this kind of period, suddenly, if you would ask people in the 90s, and ask my parents, is there a future? Everybody's like, absolutely, yes, there's a future. And in the 60s, or even in the 80s, if you ask them, is there, is there a future? And they're like, well, maybe not. Today, we are very much doubtful about the future, the possibility of the future, but it's kind of, it's not tomorrow. It's, you know, 50 years from now, the waters will rise and so on. But I think there's something to learn about precisely about how all these things are interconnected. It's not only the underground, it's not only the suburb, it's not only the space race, it's not only the highways, it's not only race, but all these things are kind of merged. And, you know, within my project, there's a question of methodology also here, of like you need to focus on, on something, but I think, or at least what I'm trying to, to try to show both through this image and in my other research is how 
architecture has this unique capacity of consolidating many of these things into one image or object or building. You, you know, you go to Boston, where I live now, and you look at uh, Boston City Hall. It, it's about, you know, the Kevin Lynch and the perception of the city. It's about how, it's about brutalism. And it's also, an, it's a city, new, city sized nuclear shelter. So architecture has this kind of capacity that if you shift the way you look at it, you every time you see something else, and I think in that sense, it's it's a unique uh, discipline. Thank you. So I have a small question. I'm here with Ellie in the same room. Uh, First of all, it's, it's really fascinating. And, and I think what's especially interesting for me is this kind of really capture this uh, uh, confused and fascinate, fascinated state of architects that are also kind of, they're also uh, fearful, but they're also very curious. And uh, this image of architects, or, or to put the image of this pit hole in, in the desert uh, in architecture, this was really interesting because at the end, the end it's an experiment in, uh, in the material extraction. But what, was it, what I'm uh, kind of wondering now and concerned about it is whether uh, uh, in this image we see here, are there um, kind of uh, critical, they offer a warning, or the opposite, they are kind of. Uh, um, decide, decide, decide to be, uh, listen, be, be kind of part, of part of this and uh, embrace this huge atomic uh, threat as a creative potential. Uh, the strength, the <laughs> hybrid zoom. Uh, um, um, I don't think it matters. And I say that as like maybe I can see Ron in the Zoom, who was my undergrad history teacher. Um, but I think as a historian, it doesn't necessarily matter to try and penetrate exactly what Oscar Neumann or anyone else was thinking at the time. First of all, because they're probably going to be wrong. And it might be impossible to, to even if you know they, they write. So you have to decide that you believe what they write and so on. I think what's important is what do we learn from the historical document? Um, my personal inclination is to think that this is a particular drawing. It's precisely what you were saying. It's this kind of um, charmed or you know taken by the possibilities without a lot of criticality. Um, but again, I think. I don't think the point of historical inquiry is to identify exactly what people were thinking, but rather to, at least for me, to understand um, the kind of conditions of possibility that let something happen at a certain moment in time and what we can learn from them, at least I think. And I mean, in that sense, I uh, think of myself as a kind of operational historian like what can we learn from the pre from the past about that that is helpful or reflective about the present um so i think there's a lot of uh ways in which we can look at the history of how people engage with technology and the possibility of of catastrophe in the cold war that is very much applicable to the way we think about climate uh, change um, and there are people doing this work. Um, so it's really a question of um, what you do with history rather than the idea of, you know, what were they necessarily thinking? Because there, I mean, there's, there's a ton of people at the same time, both from architecture and elsewhere, who are, um, you know, demonstrating against atomic weapons, doing like eco-friendly projects, living in hippie town, and being trying to be super uh, conscious about you know withdrawing from society. There's a, a an array of things. Um, I don't know if that answers it. Uh, 
אהרון, רצית להגיד משהו? שוב. עוד שאלות? More questions, comments? היות וכבר שלוש וחצי כמעט, אני חושב שנסגור את הסשן. אלי, ממש תודה רבה, מעניין, מעניין מאוד. תודה רבה, תודה. אני מניח שהרבה מאיתנו נשמח לקרוא את המאמר שיצא. תודה, אלי. אז תודה לכולם ולהתראות. תודה רבה. תודה, תודה רבה, אלי. Thank you.